of this session, the impact of DNS encryption on the internet ecosystem and its users. Um, Andrew Campling, you have the floor. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Nadia, and uh, good morning to uh, everyone um, to this uh, first uh, uh, workshop of uh, Eurodig. Um, uh, as uh, Nadia said, my name is Andrew Kempling. Um, I'll be moderating the discussion today, supported by my colleague uh, Mikhail uh, uh, Anisimov, uh, who will be uh, acting as the online moderator. Um, uh, I'll be joined by three key, key participants. They are Andre Philip, Nick Lehman, and Vittorio Batola, who I'll introduce um, in a moment, um, and also by uh, Ilona Stadnik, who will be the uh, reporter from the uh, Geneva uh, Internet Platform, um, just to give you some uh, background to who is involved. Um, the topic that we're discussing today um, um, is um, uh, encrypted DNS, specifically DNS over HTTPS, uh, or DOE, as it's often called. Um, and just to give us context, I'm going to very briefly remind you of the session teaser, because um, I'm conscious that maybe not everyone will have had a chance to uh, read the uh, Eurodig wiki uh, before joining the session. Um, so DOE uh, is a technical standard, a re fairly recently introduced technical standard, um, designed to enhance the privacy and security of end users by preventing uh, so-called man-in-the-middle attacks and eavesdropping on DNS uh, traffic. Um, and browser vendors and others have proposed different implementation models uh, for DOE, but essentially some of those may lead to the centralization of uh, internet infrastructure. Um, and our session today will look into the effects of centralized and encrypted DNS name res resolution on cybersecurity, as well as some of the effects of browser centric control of core uh, infrastructure functions on policy making and the architecture of the internet. And we will endeavor, as far as we're able, to focus more on the policy uh, aspects rather than the sort of pure technical aspects, although clearly they are closely uh, interlinked today. Uh, the structure of the session is we'll have short opening comments from each of our key participants um, and then we move uh, into the most important part which, which is the discussion which we'll aim to involve as many people as possible from the various channels including the zoom room uh, and the other channels um, as, as was explained uh, earlier and we will aim to draw the conversation to a close by around or just after 12.50 um, in order to allow Ilona, uh, the reporter from the Geneva Internet Platform for our session, to share some of the session messages and gain agreement to those uh, messages from the participants and the audience uh, through rough consensus, because uh, I'm sure we won't sorry, 100% agree. Um, so that's the plan for the session uh, today. Um, so what I'd like to do without further ado uh, is to um, uh, introduce our key participants. Um, so firstly, I'm going to ask uh, Andre Philip, uh, the CEO of the Czech uh, Domain Registry and a RIPE NCC board member, to uh, share with us um, his opening thoughts. So if we could unmute uh, Andre, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Andre. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I prepared a couple of slides, but uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not I'm sure if I can share them now. So uh, I will start with our slides, and maybe maybe I'll be able to manage it later. I but uh, let me start with a very brief uh, uh, introduction of the technology. I know that it was said at the beginning that this panel should be focused on, on policy, but I think the technology explanation is very important. In, in every, you know, as in a normal run of DNS, there are, there are several actors in the game that that uh, the traffic you, you initiate are passed through. Uh, that's uh, that's your browser, for example, or some of your application. Then we have an operating system that that has a stuff resolver. Uh, then usually we have some some resolver in your network, in your home network or corporate, which is very often just a forwarder that forwards the traffic to some. Uh, to some uh, resolver that really does the resolution, that does the recursive resolution, and then we have authoritative service. So we can identify at least five players in this game, which is which is quite a lot. And all this traffic is unencrypted. Uh, 
there is a technology called DNSSEC, but I really I want to state that this has nothing nothing to do with DOT or DOH. So that's that's a separate issue. DNSSEC helps to ensure the integrity, but doesn't do anything with encryption. So we have those five players in the game, and now we have, uh, a new technology emerged, uh, which is called uh, DOT. Uh, uh, DOH, sorry. Uh, and this technology uh, has the ability actually to to bypass basically uh, some of those actors in the game. The ability of this technology allows uh, that the browser, the application, has its own resolver, and this resolver is basically located outside the the, the network, outside the control of the of the corporate network, home network. In case, for example, if you have a parental control home. So that's a significant change. The traffic is encrypted, so that sounds really good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the choice of resolvers currently is pretty limited. Uh, basically, every application has some default. Uh, the application that, that enforces it, which is not much these days, but application that enforces the OH has some default uh, 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 resolver, which, which might be changed. That's, of course, an option. but. As we know, you know the default setups are usually the most common. People usually do not change those settings, and that's that's the that's the significant problem. So uh, basically, DOH is not distinguishable from a normal HTTPS traffic. So that that's another issue, uh, because uh, that means uh, that uh, nobody who is oh thank you very much for the slides. Uh, so I'm I was describing the situation in slide number two. Uh, if you can see the, show the picture, please. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, th there are like example of how the traffic flows. You can see the, the blue uh, arrows means the unencrypted traffic, the, the red or orange or what color is that is it's encrypted traffic. And as you can see one scenario, there are multiple scenarios. Please know that DNS is very powerful protocol and there are many scenarios that can be uh, use, but in in very typical scenario, the operating system resolver and the uh, the enterprise or or local firewall is usually bypassed, and that causes several issues. If you can please go to the next slide. Um, uh, DOH is not distinguishable from the normal HTTPS protocol. That means that uh, operator of the firewall of the corporate you know edge of the corporate network uh, has no clue what kind of traffic is that. And usually in DNS, there are often some uh, principles that either prevent uh, a user from using, uh, from entering central site, several sites, usually because of some maybe security reasons. Also, DNS at, in, in, this, in this point is very often used for parental control. So uh, user that uses DOH is just bypassing those controls. Uh, there is also some security issues related with that. For example, in many corporates, you have so-called split DNS. That means that if you uh, have a DNS query inside the network, you can you can enter several sites, and there are some internal DNS system. While if you if you go from outside, those that DNS is hidden. But of course, if you can bypass uh, the the corporate firewall, then the query for internal sites go to the to the external resolver. It's probably not resolved. But the external resolver now has uh, some knowledge about the internal uh, network that also includes the reverse DNS lookup. So that's another issue that uh, you know you can provide some information about the internal network, which is not, of course, intended. Uh, uh, another aspect is uh, related to some, um, let's say, local legislative. In many countries, uh, unfortunately, including uh, mine, for example, there are some restrictions for several websites. In, in case of my country, th those are websites with uh, hazard games, for example, online casinos and stuff like that. And of course, uh, it's very easy and, and very handy to, again, enforce this policy in DNS. So the law says that ISP should block those sites, and there's a list of disallowed sites. Uh, sites and those sites are just names. So, so basically, the only way you can stop the user is to enforce this in DNS. Of course, with DOH, if if I'm using Resolver, let's say on from from a company outside my country, this is not possible. So, there is also a small issue with the with the local legislation. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, 
Then uh, we have some several operational issues, which is something maybe my colleague from, from ISP will comment much farther. That you know, if you have DNS, the different DNS provider, uh, internet service provider, and there is some issue with uh, connectivity, it's not easy to troubleshoot who is actually uh, responsible for that. Uh, also, the same applies on the single machine because now you have an operating system resolver, but the application has a different resolver. So troubleshooting tools that uh, were uh, kind of invented or that are used for troubleshooting those problems are now not working because they are using different things. Uh, and a big and huge discussion, which I um, hope we will have today, is the uh, the issue of, of a shift of power, of centralization uh, uh, of DNS queries. Currently, in the traditional model, we have a, a lot of DNS resolvers, basically every internet service provider, every enterprise, uh, has its own resolver. So it's very uh, fractioned ecosystem uh, with a lot of players. And nobody has a, a significant power there. But with DOH, especially if we are talking about DOH in browsers, uh, as a major application we all use uh, daily, uh, this might be an issue. If, if all the browsers will use, let's say, two, three DOH providers, now we will concentrate most of the DNS queries of the internet to a few companies. Uh, which, which might be a problem for stability and robustness of the internet. Of course, you know, such a company is a, is a perfect target of, of an attack. Uh, it has some privacy issues. Again, I hope we will have some further discussions, but very briefly, uh, currently, you know, if you are connected to the internet, your ISP, of course, have a lot of information about your behavior. Uh, uh, the provider can can you know knows what what size are you looking at what what services are you using uh, and DNS is one part of that information but for the ISP it's not the, the the key one but now you provide the DNS information to someone else so so there is another player who has uh, again information about the the sites you you access the services you use. So you extend the group of uh, uh, companies that have some information, some private information about you. Uh, so that's another problem. And also the shift of powers, uh, shift of power uh, means uh, one more thing. Currently we have a, in the classical model, the kind of power, the, the way how DNS works is mostly based on the decision of authoritative side of, of, of the DNS resolution. That means I can, that, uh, for example, can uh, issue a new domain, can can make some change in domains, and there is a, a whole ecosystem behind ICANN, like TLD pro top level domain providers like us, for example. But if we will concentrate uh, all the queries just to a few companies, few private companies, then of course, at one day they will they will realize that they have 90% of DNS queries and. In, in their position, they could then, for example, decide that some domain will appear or disappear from the DNS system. So that's another aspect how we can look at it, that we will concentrate uh, the power about this ecosystem from the traditional model to, to, to those companies who will be able to respond to most of the queries. So that's my very technical introduction. And I think I can, I'm happy to pass to the other speakers. Many thanks, uh, Andre. Um, and I can see you've already started to stimulate some discussion on the chat, which we'll no doubt get back to uh, um, momentarily. So many thanks for those uh, uh, initial comments and explanations. Um, uh, our second um, uh, key participant is Nick Lehman. Uh, Nick is a senior network architect uh, with Deutsche Telekom and is currently trying uh, trialing um, DO, um, uh, a DO resolver um, in the DT uh, network. So, uh, Nick, over to you. Yeah, so thank you. Can you hear me? Does it work? Great, thanks. So, uh, also thanks uh, to Andre. Um, so, let's see what's left uh, from my statement because I think he covered already a lot of, say, challenges and issues we see. Um, <laughs> so, thanks for that. Um, first of all, um, so our view is that in general, um, of course, DOT and DOH, they are providing additional security for the end users. But it also depends highly on the setup and scenario. So, for instance, if you are look on a typical, looking on a typical home network where the router is connected to our network and using our own DNS servers. 
the communication in general is secure. So there is no in man in the middle and so on. And even if there is a man in the middle, for instance, in the home network of the end user and so on, I think um, encrypting DNS is probably not the biggest problem the, the user has in that case because the attacker can see also everything else. It's different, of course, if you are talking about, say, open environments like hotspots and stuff like that. So there, of course, encryption definitely helps because there might be people or attackers looking on traffic and stuff like that. On the other hand, what, what we also see at the moment, there is no clear indication if you are talking about browsers, whether uh, UH is really used or not. So you can switch it on, but you get no feedback at all from the browser during your session, whether all the DNS requests are really uh, encrypted or not. So the user might think, okay, everything is fine and encrypted, but in fact, there is no encryption because for instance, uh, the DOH server is blocked or there was a portal page, uh, things like that. Um, what we also see in the classical models uh, within the providers or ISPs, that most of the DNS traffic goes to the own platform. So for instance, in DT case, we have in general around 95% of DNS traffic going to our own platform. There's a very small fraction of DNS traffic going to external DNS servers, as you can see, next page, I think, uh, yeah. As you can see on the statistics here, it's for one sample location. And also most of the user, I guess 95% or 97%, they have no, no clue what DNS is. They have never seen it. And on the other hand, their overall user experience heavily depends on DNS. So it's really critical for user experience performance of the internet, a poorly performing DNS server also gives poor performance for the end user. We also have a bunch of features in our DNS which helps us to optimize the network. For instance, we distribute users to the closest uh, CDN location, things like that. We have load sharing for certain impl uh, applications implemented, for instance, for voice that uh, not every user ends up on the same server, but that we distribute them over the servers. And of course, all these kind of features are necessary to run a network. And that only works uh, if the DNS is owned by us and the user is using our DNS. If the user is using an external DNS, then we lose those features. I think it's okay for the number of users which are actively changing their DNS, so they can if they want, no problem with that. But say an automatic move to an external platform, that is really um, a challenge we see. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so I think the discussion is not whether it's really encryption is good or encryption is bad. I think the general agreement is that encryption is good, but the question is how is it used and what is basically the result of moving certain things into a browser, for instance, and losing control. Because the main challenge is that we, for instance, use, uh, lose all those kind uh, of features. They are just not existing anymore because an external DNS does not provide that kind of features. Also, Looking on, on the users, they might have wrong assumptions on security and data privacy. So they just click on uh, encrypt DNS, but they do not know whether it's encrypted or not. They do not know which uh, server the traffic is basically hitting in most of the cases. On the other hand, we have extremely high standards, uh, at least in Europe and in Germany, in terms of data privacy. So for the user, it might be way better just to keep the existing on that server instead of moving to an external platform where no one knows where the servers are. And also things like auto-upgrade, they are not very transparent. So if a, like a browser does an auto-upgrade, it might do it if you click on secure DNS. It might depend on the additional DNS settings you have somewhere in the operating system. And most of the um, users do not know, as I mentioned earlier, about DNS. So I think they are, in most of the cases, kind of lost there. Um, and also the operational aspects uh, are critical. So what happens, for instance, if the user switches on DNS and there's a problem? Debugging is kind of easy if it's our own DNS platform. But if the user uses five different browsers and a different setting, uh, say, in a home router, it's extremely difficult to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. And um, as mentioned, um, that's also a thing which, from my point of view, is missing in the whole discussion. So first of all, how 
ed to educate the user and also to give the user feedback. Like, I mean, if you click or if you browse the internet today, you can see whether the access to a web page is encrypted or not. So it's clearly signaled inside the browser. If you, for instance, uh, set uh, secure DNS in a browser, you get no feedback or, at all. So you have no clue whether the traffic is really encrypted or not. And that even might change during your session, depending on certain settings or capabilities of the network in between. So I think it's a kind of still long way to go to have, a, say, a solution which really fulfills also requirements uh, in terms of discovery and so on, which is still uh, lacking from the overall solution. And also, I would expect, uh, again, very long discussions about uh, moves and changes in terms of centralization to certain over-the-top DNS providers and so on. So that's from my side. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Nick. Um, that was a helpful uh, um, uh, sort of set of thoughts. Um, uh, what, what I'd like to do then is to uh, move on to our final of our three uh, key participants. Um, uh, uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Vittorio uh, Batola. Uh, Vittorio is Head of Policy and Innovation for um, Open Exchange. Um, and Vittorio will give uh, his insights uh, before we move to uh, um, and broaden the discussion. So, Vittorio, over to you. Hello. Uh, well, good morning and thank you. Uh, I think my role here would be to recap a little the policy consequences of DNS over HTTPS. I mean, there was an entire workshop devoted to this uh, in last year's URDIC, so I mean, the video is online, you can look at it. But there are at least four points that I would like to raise. and maybe uh, put at the, the center of the discussion. So the first one is that, the, uh, especially the OH, I mean, the NSO HPS uh, creates a change in control points. So, I mean, uh, it also in the balance of power between the platforms, the browser makers and the ISPs. I mean, originally DNS was a, an ISP thing. It was basically run by, mostly by the ISPs. And now the browser are basically becoming the controllers of where the DNS queries go. And they, so they become the gatekeepers of who can provide the, the DNS services. And so the, there is a potential for centralization. So the, this is a, a, a concern in, in many. I mean, the browser market is very centralized, much more than DNS uh, operations market is. And so this, there, this, there could be, I mean, at least in some deployment models, uh, a way of uh, self-preferencing so that uh, browsers can basically decide who is going to uh, provide the, the most of the answers to DNS queries and so exploit their dominant position to say, enter into nearby, nearby markets or help entrance into nearby markets like the DNS resolution one. And so in the end, there is a competition issue. Uh, the third issue is a uh, potential for fragmentation. I mean, no one, no one DNS operator was big enough to basically create its own namespace and impose it in a way. Everyone is using the ICANN route, basically almost everyone, because that's the only common way of talking with each other. So in, in, in the case of maybe a browser that have a, a very big market share, they could actually be big enough to start uh, fragmenting the namespace. And so adding TLDs or moving TLDs or these kind of things with, with uh, really with a global impact. And the fourth point is that uh, this affects the, bal the balance between the individual and collective rights especially when DOH affects the effectiveness of uh, filters that are based on DNS and that are often applied in several countries and also sometimes on a voluntary basis, sometimes for security issues by ISPs, such as malware filtering, there's parental control, there's all sorts of filtering. And uh, of course, I mean, the DOH was explicitly designed as a technology to um, stop, um, stop this from working. So basically circumvent this kind of filtering, especially the one made by governments in the name of freedom of expression which is good to a certain extent, but then the, in, in other parts of the world, such as Europe, there is a different trade-off between the freedom of expression and, uh, for example, human dignity or consumer protection, or, I mean, a, a number of other rights that are affected uh, sometimes by blocking access to content. And so uh, the same for law enforcement, so for the relationship between law enforcement and privacy. And so this, this is an, uh, an open issue. Of course, these issues depend on the deployment models. So different browsers have adopted different deployment models. Mozilla was the first to deploy this, and so they went, I mean, full, full force, I'd say, in, in the OH. And uh, of course, this created all the issues that, that we know, if, even if now they basically stop the deployment to the US. So they, uh, apparently they have no plans at this point in time, or they made no announcement on bringing the OH by default to Europe. 
Then there's the Apple model. It's, uh, I'd say, quote unquote, because it's not a, an official proposal by Apple, it's a proposal by some Apple engineers at the IETF, so it's unclear whether this is a plan by Apple or just some individual thoughts. But uh, the, the idea is basically to remove the resolvers and so basically have the, the, the browser contact directly the destinations. And so, uh, for example, Facebook would have a, a resolver providing information about Facebook domains, and Google would have another resolver for Google domains, and so on. And uh, this is, I mean, uh, creates even one more issue because the user is losing control of where the data go. It would be the destinations that decide which is always being used for which domains, which is the opposite of the GDPR model in which the user has control of, of the data. The final one is the model adopted by Google and also by Microsoft, which is uh, possibly the, the least problematic in policy terms because they do, don't change the operator. They just try to upgrade the connection from unencrypted to encrypted, but towards the, the same operator. Still, uh, th this doesn't address the fundamental issue that uh, the browser is still the gatekeeper. So the browser is still in charge of making the decisions of who gets the DNS queries. And so that's, that's a real deep change in, in the provision of DNS services. So I think uh, that uh, in European terms, we, we have a question for ourselves and for the community, which is whether do we need to address this issue at the policy level, even by principles. Of course, uh, no one wants to regulate the technology, which is ever changing. But there are at least a couple of principles that are involved in this discussion. One is the discussion on self-preferencing by platforms. Yeah, so all operators, all DNS operators should have a chance to I mean, be supported by your browsers. And so they should not be disadvantaged by the browser picking certain operators and, and not others. And uh, so there should be especially attention for to smaller operators, which are very common in Europe, and, and also to self-hosted servers. I mean, open source free software servers that can be hosted by individuals. Uh, it would be a problem if browsers could uh, discriminate, for example, operators from countries that are embargoed in the US, or that simply they, they don't like, or they don't like the country's policies. The other point that could uh, warrant regulation is the, the, the filtering issue. I mean, the, there's a lot of different views of people. Some people think the filtering is always bad. Some people think it's always good. The problem is that, uh, is that it's there, and, and most European countries are doing it. And so there, there should be some attention to the fact that at least it's done in uniform ways, and there are uh, proper guarantees against uh, overblocking, against uh, I mean, uh, procedures for redress when there are mistakes. Uh, and also, there, there is no circumvention so that uh, there is not this, this kind of unfair competition uh, so that ISPs are forced to block uh, certain websites by the law of their country, but the global platforms can just uh, I mean, avoid it and make everything accessible. And this, uh, so this skews also the, 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 the competition and directs the choice of, of the user. So, and also the, it would be very important to have a, a chance for open implementations and tools. So if there were a standard to do this, uh, both in terms of policy and in technical terms, at least even smaller operators would do, it, uh, do, would do this better and it would be possible to have free tools and to have interoperability in a number of things. And so I think these are the, are the, the two policy issues related to DOH that might enter into the discussion on European regulation with the Digital Services Act. So, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vittorio, um, uh, for, for those thoughts and, and sort of broadening the, uh, uh, the, 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 sort of the, the debate so somewhat. Um, now, we're going to um, open up for questions. So just to explain, those of you on Zoom, you can raise your hand to ask a question, or if you uh, want to have the question read out, you can, uh, if, if you uh, prefix it with a Q, so it's clear you want it read out on the chat, and it's not just a comment for other people in the chat, you can do that. Um, and, and I think um, uh, that, that our uh, remote moderator is also monitoring some other channels uh, as well, so we have the ability to uh, pull in questions um, uh, fr from elsewhere. Um, and I note from those explanations from uh, uh, Andre, Nick, and Vittorio, um, uh, I guess one of the challenges is going to be how you explain uh, uh, concepts like DOE to a typical user um, uh, without uh, confusing them with all of the technology. Um, and I think that, that's going to be one of the challenges with the change uh, in, in the internet uh, going forward. Um, but let's let's see if there are questions um, that, that we've logged so far. Um, uh, so I don't know if Mikel, I, I know you've picked up a couple of questions from the chat. If you want to come in with those, uh, yes, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. This is Mikhail, and I'm a remote moderator. Uh, we have a 
several questions in the chat and actually i have uh, one participant who want to answer who add who want to add a comment lively so uh nadia could you please uh help me to uh switch on the video and the audio for adele the dick Nadia, you mute yourself. I can hear your command. Hi, uh, the remote moderator for this session is Alka Pals, and he has unmuted Adil Sadiq. Adil, you have the floor. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm actually a student from University of Nottingham, UK. So I understand that DNS is something that we, being an end user, does not control. So what can I do being an internet user to protect myself against all that DNS and privacy issues? Like, is there a client maybe that I can install that can provide me services like DOS or DOT or maybe anything that I can do to protect myself that if I don't trust my ISPs or any other organization? Thanks. Great, thank you, uh, Adele. I don't know if either of our three uh, key participants may wish to come in with a, a thought on, on that um, in terms of uh, tools that you may wish to comment on. Yes, Nick, so I, I can comment. I mean, um, if it comes to clients, uh, there are already a couple of clients out there like uh, Firefox and also Chrome supporting uh, DOH. But in all cases, you have to configure it. So it doesn't work basically automatically, at least not in, in Europe. I think there are also ideas to do a kind of auto upgrade where it's uh, used anyway. But even in that case, you do not have really control about uh, what is going to happen uh, with your data. So I think um, it was mentioned an important topic is really user, user education and also to make sure if you have, for instance, a trust relationship to one of your service providers, that you keep that kind of re relationship, even if you change, for instance, the protocol to DOH or DOT. Great, thanks, uh, Nick. Um, so ho hopefully that gives you an understanding, uh, a deal in terms of some of the options, but it uh, uh, sounds like you need to uh, um, become more involved that way to, to actually make, make those settings um, uh, work for you. Um, uh, Mikhail, do we have uh, other questions from the Zoom chat? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. We have a few questions more. So uh, the question in the chat is, uh, assuming a global adoption of DNS encryption, be it DOT, be it DOH, or a combination thereof, can we drop the DNS back then? Uh, I would like, I would also like uh, everyone to add if you want to address this question to someone specific or you want to address them to all of the speakers. So I think this question is for everyone. Okay. Um, does anyone want to come in uh, on, on that? Uh... Well, yeah, I have a comment. I think that the, let's say the, the theoretical answer is no. Since I mean, you, you, DNSSEC is doing something different. DNSSEC is about the integrity of, of, the, of the response, the fact that it was not modified. I mean, let's say when from starting from the root and from the authoritative uh, servers of the domain and getting all the way to, to the client. But the, the practical answer is a bit different because in the end, uh, most people today trust the resolver to do the DNSSEC validation. And so, I mean, if you trust the resolver to tell you whether the answer is correct or not, then uh, you trust the resolver to tell you whatever the, the resolver wants. So it doesn't make uh, a lot of a difference whether the resolver actually uses DNSSEC to decide whether the, the answer is correct or not, or whether it uses uh, any other policy or, or system. So at that point in time, once you, I mean, and this is also the, the thought of um, some of the new edge proponents, uh, once you connect in an authenticated way to a DNS or a GPS server, uh, so a, a resolver, then you you have to trust whatever it says, and so it doesn't make a lot of a difference whether the NSEC is used or not, or since you're not going to check it personally anyway. And uh, and actually, this makes things even better because if you rely on filtering services or mangling services uh, that are done by the resolver, then this makes them work, which is not the case with, with the NSEC validation. Yeah, if I may join that, you know, the DNSSEC does different things that ensures the integrity. 
And even if you trust your resolver, still there are certain paths of the DNS traffic that are not encrypted and and uh, then the integrity must be um, ensured by a different method. So uh, still DNSSEC is, um, is a technology that is in use there and it's pretty important to, to be there because even the resolver may be somehow, uh, uh, you know, even th there might be some, some false data that the resolver fetches and that might have some consequences, which is not possible with DNSSEC. So, that's a different technology for a focus on a different thing and and we shouldn't drop it anyway yep. thanks uh, andre um and i think i've seen we we, 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 we have we had some more question and do you want to comment anything or we can go further with the other question uh, I, I was just going to add that i think I've, the latest stats i've seen dnssec take up is actually increasing um, um, uh, over the last few months. So uh, the, 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 certainly the introduction of uh, Doe doesn't appear to have uh, slowed the, the adoption of DNSSEC uh, recently. Uh, agreed. So we're moving on. We have the next question. Uh, it's also addressed to all the speakers. Uh, does the emergence of DOH create a two-tier internet? Legacy devices can only use legacy DNS, clear text, and new devices use DOH. And would it necessarily necessarily disadvantage the more vulnerable in society and at legacy costs? I remember this question is for everyone. So uh, if you, if anyone from our speakers wants to command, please feel free to do it. I think Nick wants to come in there, by the look of it. <laughs> yes, I can see it, say at least a few words. So I think, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's all about software, so I would say. So of course, um, it's, I think it's not so much about new devices and old devices, because you can always do a software update. So I mean, if you're talking, for instance, about existing routers and so on, I would say um, it's not so much about DOH, it's more about DOT, and it's up to the uh, service provider, ISP or router vendor, whether he wants to support it or not. I think it's on the, if you're talking about clients in terms of browsers and other apps, there are basically two models. Either every application programmer implements it in the application itself, which is probably a very long way to go, or you use something like proxies in between so that you have basically a piece of software sitting on your end device and that kind of piece of software is doing DOH to the server or DOT to the server and inside the end device it's not encrypted. So I wouldn't say it's really about legacy or not legacy, it's more a matter of time. I mean, you see more and more browsers supporting uh, DOH, first operating systems supporting DOH, Thanks, Nick. I think Andre wanted to come in as well. Yeah, I maybe want to add that nobody's dropping the traditional DNS protocol. Uh, and, you know, it has been with us since, I think, ages. I think it's 83 or something like that. So it's a long time and, and it would be very impractical to drop this protocol. And also the, the answers to the queries you, you do with the traditional DNS or DOH, in theory, should be the same. So. There shouldn't be a difference. There are, there are some tiny, tiny issues, like was mentioned uh, uh, you know, by by Nick about, for example, optimization to to some CDNs and stuff like that. But you should you should receive the same answer, and the protocol should be with us uh, and will be with us for a long time. Nobody is dropping it because the the number of devices that will still use some traditional DNS protocol is enormous, and it's not easy to change everything. Uh, so that's not really a, a huge change. The, the, there might be just the change in that that some of the application is is using one DNS provider, another application, another, and both are you know sending bits of your private pri private data to some of the providers. So that's a change, but I don't think devices will be different. Okay, thanks, uh, Andre. Uh, Mikel, do we have uh, another question? Uh, yes, actually, we have a lot of questions, and I can see that people are really, really interested in it. Uh, the next question, and it's 
that the combination of question and command is also for everyone. I understand the fear of centralization or further market concentration. What do the panelists think of having European ISPs like Deutsche Telekom offer DOH? Or we could also set up a European DNS resolver as a kind of public service. If we, if we had such European alternatives, it would be possible to offer DNS services on the basis of the legal protection of the GDPR and in line with other European legal requirements. Please, if this is also to everyone, it's quite a complicated question. Well, okay. so I, I, maybe I start because it mentions DT. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question, in fact. Um, at the moment, or let's start differently. In the past, I mean, DNS was part of the infrastructure of every ISP. So it was meant for the end users of that ISP. And also, I mean, we are looking into implementing or supporting DOT and DOH, but the main focus are our own uh, customers, basically, basically, as in the past. So I think, of course, you could uh, offer like a uh, European uh, DOH service uh, or certain ISPs could do that, but it's a completely different model in terms of, um, well, talking to users which are not, for instance, on your own network and stuff like that. So it would move you to a position like offering over the top uh, DNS to almost everyone. So it's a completely different product and setup. And I think that, that's a challenge. So because, um, well, to be honest, it costs money, it's complex, uh, how do you do the rollout and so on? It's very different from the scenarios um, we have today, at least for an ISP, because the ISP focuses on own infrastructure, service for the own customers, they are SLAs uh, related and so on. And that might be very different if you move to a model where everyone from everywhere can basically access your own UH service. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, Andre, did you want to come in on that? Uh, yes. Uh, I hope I, I stated it in my initial speech, but I will try to repeat it again. Uh, I think it's really the, the best way how to use DNS is to use DNS, that, which is provided by ISP. If you do not trust your ISP, then you have a problem because, you know, if you are using network of an ISP, that ISP has control over parts of your data anyway. Uh, it can it can wiretap the communication. It can see which sites you are you are accessing and stuff like that. So the best way how to protect your data is not to increase the number of subjects that that has some knowledge of your data. So that's why I would really suggest to use uh, uh, DNS provided by ISP. Also, it means this DNS, if you know there's some relationship to the CDNs, is in the optimal uh, relationship with CDNs, and and also. Since all the all the clients of the ISP are behind uh, some resolver, the the, uh, the connection between DNS and, and and users, which is behind the resolver, is unclear. So so that's for me probably the best way from the privacy point of view. However, you know, user is free to use any DNS he or she wants. That that's okay. Even my company is providing a D open DNS resolver, which supports DOT and DOH, and some people use it for, for several reasons. But, but uh, I don't think it makes sense to make some you know, combined European effort uh, for a, for a DO, DOH service, the DNS service. It doesn't make sense to me. That would be a waste of energy, because anyway, every ISP needs to solve this issue. And, and I, I think they, they are doing the be their best, what they can do. Uh, and you know this wouldn't probably add nothing special. Although there are some companies that are using DOH uh, and and DNS as, as a filtering service, so so that's a, that's a fair competition. You know you you join this DOH service and they provide you some additional services like like for example special filtering or whatever some protection based on DNS, which is possibility. Uh, that, that's a fair market, but you know do, doing something on European level doesn't seem to me logical to me. Thanks, uh, Andre Vittorio. I think you had a comment. Yeah, no, the, the comment is that uh, absolutely yes, I think that uh, European ISPs uh, should offer DOH resolvers. First of all, because I mean, uh, I, in my initial intervention, I mentioned the concerns, but basically there is a, a lot of positive sides in moving to encrypted DNS uh, connections in terms of privacy and security. So 
uh, I mean, a, a good ISP should, should be running to provide these as, as soon as possible, of course, after uh, the proper experimentation to, to, to the customers. And so I would uh, expect actually most European ISPs to offer encrypted DNS as well. Uh, I don't know if it makes sense to have just one centralized European public resolver, but why not? I mean, if people want to do it. That the point uh, is that if you dislike centralization, I mean, the more encrypted DNS servers you have, the better. So uh, we just need to make sure that uh, once you deploy these, uh, I mean, the wealth of new DNS resolvers which offer encrypted connections, then it's actually possible to use them easily in the browsers and in any client applications in the operating systems and so on. Yeah, I think I have one, one more comment. Um, if it comes to the European uh, DOH server, I think it will be very different from the servers the ISPs are running because I mentioned earlier, we have our own features implemented in, in, our, D in our DNS servers and they would be also, of course, available if we add DOT and DOH as a protocol. But those features are not necessarily implemented in a European server infrastructure because I wouldn't expect, for instance, that uh, like an off-net user from Iceland or wherever wants to have our load sharing for voice. <laughs> so, so it would be a different implementation. Um, here, the remote moderator speaking. Um, I've received also a question. Um, and the question is, can we have a system where we do not have a resolver, which can monitor which addresses are resolved, but rather a blockchain-like solution where having a node will prevent others from seeing which addresses you're visiting? Interesting question, Andre. You, oh, Vittorio, I think, was no, coming. Well, you yeah, know, my comment is that, um, that that's welcome. Of, of course, then there's the question if it's the same namespace or a different namespace. I mean, that, that's a, but the point is that then you would have to trust the blockchain. So, I mean, uh, the people that run the blockchain, which in theory is everyone, but in practice is a limited set of people that have the resources to, at least with the current uh, blockchain technologies, to run the, the blockchain. So, I mean, in the end, uh, if you want to get online services, unless you run everything yourself, you're gonna, always going to need to trust someone. The point is rather to make sure that you as a, as a user have a choice. So, for example, I would also advise if you're really concerned with DNS privacy that you could run your DNS resolver yourself in your home network. Actually, there's products like the PyHole, which also gets the, I mean, it brings you the added value of uh, filtering out advertising, which are, are broken if you cannot choose uh, the, the, your own resolver, but in, in, indeed there could, could be also a solution if you're really uh, very keen on preserving your privacy uh, at all costs. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Vittorio Andre. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, you know, um, Again, DNS is just part of this uh, of this privacy game, you know. The uh, well, maybe maybe there might be a technology, probably not, not soon or easy, that that would do a DNS resolution for you. But, but if you really have those concerns, you don't trust your ISP, uh, then you should use different techniques, like for example VPN or, or stuff like that. You know, the just just you know using uh, somehow encrypted DNS doesn't solve the whole issue. It's, it's a lot of information that you can hide if, if you will uh, properly encrypt uh, DNS and, and also if you would like to use some blockchain technology for resolution and stuff like that, that might help, but that's not the whole, that's not the whole ecosystem. You should focus on other stuff. And, and especially if you don't trust your local ISP or local regulation in your country, which I don't think is European problem, but in many countries it might be a problem, then VPN is much better solution than, than you know, playing just with the pure DNS. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Andre. Now, I, I noted on the uh, Zoom chat that uh, uh, Tommy Jensen from Microsoft had uh, uh, asked a question, and uh, obviously we've been focused so far the discussion on browser implementations of Doe. Um, some of you uh, may know that uh, Windows 10 is currently testing uh, DOE support uh, as well within the operating system. So uh, if we can unmute uh, Tommy, um, uh, it would be good to get uh, Tommy's uh, input. Hey, can you Tommy hear me? It's unmuted now. Brilliant. Yeah, you're on Tommy. Thank you. So the question I pose in the chat is regarding the concern over GDPR requirements for DNS providers. Um, there was mention of an IETF proposal for adaptive DNS, wherein DNS queries will be routed to those servers designated by the web property owners. Um, I've joined Tommy Polly from Apple as a co-author on that draft. And my question for this audience is, what is the nature of the GDPR challenge there? 
um, from my naive point of view, the queries will be going to a Doe server owned by the same web property owner that will receive the customer's data via the page load that's that results from the DNS query. And so in theory, it should be the same parties that had the data before they would have the data after that implementation. And so I would believe that the same obligations would exist already. If that's not the case though, I would wanna understand what the concerns are related to GDPR. So does anyone want to come in on the GDPR, uh, Vittorio? Well, I was the one making the remark, so yeah. I think that the question is open, actually, that we need to ask a, a good privacy lawyer, and it's not that easy. So in a way, it could be or it could not be, uh, like you say, depending on, like, for example, whether the, the, the resolver provided by the destination really only uh, offers the service for domains that are owned by the same destination or, or if there are third parties involved. So if it's a third party running the DNS resolver for uh, the platform, for example, then it could be different because it's a new party. Or if it's also going to get the queries for other domains which are not directly managed by, by the destinations so of the, the same entity, let's say, but by, by third parties that are used inside the websites and or services that are used, then there is a privacy leak in that case because there, it's data that uh, the, this entity would not get. So, I mean, uh, unfortunately, as always with the GDPR, the answer is it depends and you need a lawyer. I think at least it's a, a, an assessment that, that needs to be done some, sometimes during this discussion. Anyone else want to come in on that? No? Uh, well, there's a start to that, uh, I think, uh, Tommy, hopefully. Yeah, but as Vittorio said, <laughs> as with all things uh, GDPR, um, uh, ask a lawyer is, is probably the best, uh, best safest answer. Um, uh, Certainly. Um, I, I guess my, my overarching point was to determine whether this was a complete blocker or whether it's just unknown territory that needs explored. And it sounds like more of the latter. You know, if I may, I agree. And, and also, by the way, in general, the, the use of uh, third-party DNS services has never been fully understood under privacy laws. I think no, no one really realized there was a privacy issue and, until this discussion started. And, and you realize that there's a lot of personal information going on back and forth in DNS queries. So, I mean, uh, in theory, it, there's the same issue if you just uh, enter a, a separate resolver, because even if you enter, uh, let's say, Equidate or whatever in, into your own configuration, then at a certain point in time, you should receive a, a privacy information with all your rights and provide consent in the informed, explicit way. Which, so, I mean, yeah, th I think this is open for discussion with the appropriate privacy authorities. Uh, and I know some of the uh, regulators in, in, in Europe do provide views when asked on such matters. So I know, for example, in the UK, the uh, Information Commissioner's Office has in the past given views on uh, DNS-related matters. So uh, um, there are third parties beyond just lawyers that can give uh, input on, on those things. Thank, Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Tommy. Um, do we have uh, more questions? Um, I, I, I see yeah. uh, 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 just yeah. hand, uh, uh, on the chat to uh, you can raise your hand as well and ask a question if uh, if you wish. Um, so thank you to to uh, remind us of that. Uh, sorry, Mikel, I think you were coming in there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. So we have uh, we have a few more questions in the chat, uh, but you're also welcome to raise your hand and to. Uh, but, sorry, sorry, it seems that uh, I had some uh, connection issues. So, uh, the next question is, uh, could we have a DNS replacement that does not allow to track users? Currently, DNS and DOH allow to track who is visiting which website. I believe this question was pretty much covered with the previous discussion about the blockchain, but if any from our panelists want to add something, not about the blockchain, but maybe for any other replacement for DNS, you're also welcome. Or we can move on. So does anyone uh, want to comment on this? It's a bit futuristic questions. Uh, how do we, uh, how can we imagine the internet without DNS? 
unless you completely change your naming system, which is always an option, but I, I'd see it uh, very hard to do. I mean, in, in the end, uh, if you rely on someone providing you a service, that, that, that party will always have access to your data. So. Uh, agree, agree. If if you don't trust DNS, you will have to trust to uh, another company who will provide you another service, whatever it could be. So moving on, uh, the question from uh, Patrick Turpy: uh, Given that most DOH providers do not have contractual relationships with their end users, that redress uh, do end users have in their even of poor performance. It means uh, incorrectly resolved addresses leading to off-network traffic and thereby decreasing streaming and CDM performance. Uh, that's actually a very good question because I have another one uh, quite similar. Uh, it was a really long comment, but I, I'll try to make a uh, long oh, story short. Uh, the question was, uh, the Currently, the end users have a contractual relations with their ISPs, and in case of low performance, they can just call to ISP and say, hey, my internet is not working. Uh, what should they do if uh, they use, for example, Cloudflare or Google DOH servers and they experience any problem? How can they uh, work with it? I believe this question is also for all three panelists. Yeah, okay, I mean, um, first of all, um, like SLAs, guarantees, and so on, we only, of course, give if our own servers are used. So if the user decides to use an external server, the first contact point, of course, would be Cloudflare. <laughs> but on the other hand, if the user does not know whether he's using an external DNS provider, it's extremely difficult to do the debugging because, of course, the first uh, point of contact is always the ISP. So my expectation is that we will see users calling us as an ISPs, but the problem is somewhere else. And that's extremely difficult to solve because you usually do not know, for instance, where in between in the chain to the resolver is the problem. So it will probably cause a lot of more debugging and challenges for solving problems. If, if there are problems. If there are no problems, everything is fine, but uh, yeah. Or for instance, if uh, the resolver provider is under attack or things like that. Thanks, uh, Nick. Does anyone else want to come in on that, that one? No. Okay. I, I see that, that uh, Carsten uh, has raised his hand. So uh, Carsten, did you uh, want to come in with a question? Yeah, it's rather a follow-up question to my initial question whether um, DOH and DOT uh, is essentially the same like DNSSEC or serves the same purpose as DNSSEC. That was a little bit of an agent provocateur question, just as I said on the chat already, to just get, get the ball rolling and to, to make it clear for, in particular, the not-so-technical audience here that um, uh, both uh, things, protocols, so to say, uh, essentially serve a, a different purpose and they're essentially also vulnerable to each other. So um, as a follow-up question, um, I just wonder would in particular the panelists know, and we've had that on the chat as well a bit, know of any kind of uh, CPE vendors, um, customer premises uh, equipment, like in particular routers, um, who are about to deploy either DOH or DOT or both of it, uh, as well as, as, as um, DNS sec checking, uh, so that in particular residential users wouldn't have to deploy any kind of like additional gear at their places uh, to get uh, the, the features of, of DOH, DOT, and DNSSEC delivered to their homes. So we've had that on the chat already, but um, maybe it might be worthwhile as well to um, have this discussed by the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carsten. Um, and I know there, there are certainly some shipping dot, I'm not sure about Doe, but uh, Nick, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, I think there are already a couple of routers at least supporting DOT. So like the, I think it was mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the chat, like uh, ABM is supporting it. Um, also, uh, the Torus, 
first router is also supporting DOT. And my expectation is um, it's basically a, like a software change in the DNS resolver of the router. So as soon as the software, the basic software will support DOT, we will see more and more routers at least supporting DOT. So my view is it's a matter of time. It's a new protocol. It needs takes time to implement. I mean, also we are looking into uh, whether it makes sense or not to implement DOT uh, in our own router. So how long will it take and questions like that. I would expect, for instance, in, in general, that if you look on the router market, the more recent models will probably support within the next year's DOT. The older ones maybe not because they are just too old. So there no, no one is basically providing new software or software upgrades. If, if I can comment too, uh, sure. I'm in very uh, nice position because we are authors of, of Not Resolver, which is currently used by Cloudflare as, as one of the main platforms for DOH. So that's the software we develop. And also we are developing CPEs like routers, uh, which was mentioned by Nick Turis. So that router, of course, supports DOT, DOH, both. And um, uh, for has been supporting that for a couple of months, maybe more than a year. So, so uh, this is open source router based on open WRT. So, so this implementation of DOH can be, of course, backported to open WRT, which is also a, a huge family of CPEs. Uh, and I, I'm sure the other vendors will follow soon because uh, this change is not very uh, technology-wise compl uh, complicated. Of course, you know we have HTTPS protocol, we have TLS, we know DNS. So combining those two. It's not super easy, but on the other hand, it, it's not a rocket science. So I'm, I'm sure other vendors will follow too. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Andre. So certainly CP, some is there and more is coming, I think is the uh, message, <coughs> Carsten. Um, I, I'm conscious that we've sort of touched on a couple of I I issues. Um, there's been some mention of uh, uh, of things like centralization. It'd be interesting to get people's views on whether you think DOE will lead to greater centralization on balance. Um, and if so, it, does it matter anyway? So uh, do, do any of you have a view on that? Uh, will, will we get more centralization from, from DOE? And uh, should users care about that? Uh, Andre. Yeah, so I commented that at the beginning, and I, I think uh, we will see more centralization because uh, browser is one of the most popular application, right? And and browser vendors are pushing DO, DOH uh, logically because HTTPS is protocol they know the best. So uh, with that push, uh, Mozilla is a, is a great example, you know, with the push in US, there's a lot of uh, centralization in DNS traffic there. So we will see more and more of that. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not very happy from that because that, that's a fundamental shift of power. That's a fundamental shift of the ensuring the stability of the internet. Uh, and um, I, I would rather have you know, more, more fraction DNS ecosystem where every uh, player has its own responsibility than a concentration of responsibility and power to a few private companies, uh, like for example, Cloudflare, Google, and, and so on. So, I'm not super happy, but you know this is the technology that's a natural development, and uh, so I expect more and more coming in this field. Thank you, uh, Andre. Yeah, I mean, if I add, I mean, I, I of course I also already said that that I was worried about this, but I would also stress that I mean, what we are seeing in DNS is just a part of the broader process in which the internet is turning into the web, or the web is taking over the internet. So, I mean, the, 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 for the last 20 years, I mean, the, the things have been going that all the applications have been turned into web applications uh, running inside browsers, either on the server side or increasingly on the client side. And uh, so this is a trend that possibly cannot be stopped, uh, but it, it is, I mean, for people that were there uh, on the internet in the, in the 90s or even before, it is a, a problem because the, the original way was that people would be able to deploy new technologies and there was a wealth of different protocols and applications uh, that, that you could uh, choose from. But uh, apparently now the browser is becoming the, the controlling entity for everything that happens on the internet. And that's of course a, a potential danger. Even if the, the, the browser people are the best people the, with the best intentions, it's still a, a potential problem. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vittorio. 
Um, Mikhail, I think uh, you, you maybe had another question to ask from uh, the chat. Yes, yes, I have another question. It's, uh, actually, it's a very practical question. How expensive is it for an ISP to deploy a DOH service? But I would like to uh, bring a bit broader perspective on that. Uh, we know that every new technology can affect the price of the service and users because the operator has to uh, think about returning of investment. So do we have the same picture with the OH and uh, other in uh, DNS encryption technologies? Yeah, so I mean, if it comes to, to costs, uh, I mean, if I look on, on the software, it's basically a new software release supporting DOT and DOH um, as a protocol. So I wouldn't say that there's almost no cost. There's a bit more performance necessary because it's encrypted and so on, but also that, uh, say, overhead is not very large. So we are talking about maybe 5 to 10% uh, more, say, compute power on the server side. And if you run a decent DNS uh, platform, 10% more performance is really not a problem. Um, it might be a diff bit different if, for instance, not, say, the home gateway itself connects uh, with a single session, say, to a DNS server, but like uh, 50 browsers sitting inside the same home. But that needs to be proven whether that is really uh, like an impact or not. So, so my guess is, or my experience is that basically the whole update itself is not very cost intensive because it's just a new protocol with a new software. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Nick. Andre, it looked like you were trying to come in there. Um, I think everything was said. Uh, um, I, I cannot comment the deployment on, on uh, service provider level, but you know, um, I, I saw many times deploying on, on end user level, you know, just it's just downloading a, a DNS resolver, like for example, or, or not DNS and, and running it. It's for, for home use, it, it's easy, of course, at ISP level, you have to ensure some service level. So it's a different thing, but, but it's really nothing huge. So I, I don't think it's technologically a huge problem. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I see uh, Carsten has uh, raised his hand, so uh, if we could uh, unmute Carsten uh, so he can ask a, a question. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted already, thank you. Um, yeah, just a, a follow-up question to my follow-up question. Um, in terms of, uh, we've, we've touched the, the fact like to what extent uh, DOT, DOH, and DNSSEC ready uh, equipment will be rolled out or has been or has been rolled out already. Um, and uh, Andre, Andre you've, you've made a point that it might be helpful not to involve too many parties. So uh, like trusting your DSL provider, for example, might actually still be a good thing. And so I just wonder whether you guys would have any kind of knowledge to what extent uh, access providers, at least across Europe, are about to deploy their own DOH services or DOT services, or both of them actually, just so that um, like DOH or, or DOT ready equipment found, would be able to find its counterpart on the other side of the line, so to say. Is there any kind of knowledge what the plans are? Um, maybe Nikolai might be able to comment on that or Gonzalo on the chat and uh, possibly also have information from other um, other access providers at, le at least in Europe. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I, I can comment on that. Um, so, of course, we are looking in DOH and DOT on our server platform, especially with DOH, the, the main challenge is the communication to the end user because you have to make your end user aware that there is DOH available and you have to make your end user uh, to reconfigure its client to use the DOH server as well. And, and, that's an, uh, and, and then the question from the end user would be, why should I do that? <laughs> Um, so I think the communication is really a big problem. It's not so much about enabling the platform itself. For DOT, I would say it's a bit easier because if you implement it in the home gateway, you can at least do some kind of silent upgrade from the home gateway to use encrypted DNS like DOT to the server. But as, as I mentioned in the initial statement, the question, especially in the typical scenario, like you trust your... Uh, access provider anyway, and the ISP running the DNS platform, what is the real benefit of upgrading that kind of connection to DOT? 
Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I know also that uh, there are some other uh, uh, European ISPs at least running trials um, in, in various countries. Um, I'm not sure if any have launched yet, but Andre, uh, did you have a comment to make on that? I have just four comment to Nikolai. Uh, I think you, you said it very well. Maybe I would add that uh, having encrypted DNS uh, is, is still better for the uh, integrity and security because then if you are just using the normal unencrypted UDP uh, DNS, there might be some security issues in that. So even uh, if you trust your ISP, I, I would suggest to uh, to convert to DOT specifically. I think it's a very good technology that 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 would really help the this um, security of DNS. Uh, DOH is a little bit different thing. I I agree with you. Yeah, I, I see DOT more as a natural evolution path to support encryption on, on the typical ISP deployments. I see DOT also a bit different. Yeah. DOH also a bit different. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I can see that uh, we, uh, Andre Malankia uh, has also uh, raised his hand uh, on Zoom. So if, you, if we could unmute uh, Andre, please. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Andre and um, I, I just have one or two questions, or, or uh, for comments anyway. Uh, so both DOH and DOT um, are okay in terms of encryption, etc. Uh, so you can guarantee your ISPs are not gonna gonna track you. However, they will be able to uh, to follow all of your uh, remaining communications. So if you convert your DNS names to IP addresses, uh, any follow up connections that you do. Uh, your ISP will still be able to track them. So there is really no uh, privacy compared uh, with your local ISP. Uh, if you consider the, the providers that might be able to provide the DOH and DOT service, uh, this can be a lot. So uh, I, I'm assuming things like China might, uh, might actually have the government provide that service something like that. Uh, you might also have global providers like Google or Cloudflare to provide that service. But then the, the question is, uh, if an end user thinks, okay, let's use this one because someone said that this is safer, how does the user choose? Uh, what about privacy? So how does the user guarantee that uh, if they see advertised that Google has the DOH or DOT provider, is that really safe for them? Well, probably not in terms of privacy. So the end user itself uh, will probably do a technique like, oh, let's uh, subscribe to Gmail or Google Plus or something else because it's trendy. Everyone is doing that, uh, but in reality, it doesn't do that much for privacy at them. So uh, without actually knowing how the technology works, and most end users will never know how the technology works, this is actually not going to be that much effective. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Andre, does anyone uh, want to uh, c come in on those comments? Uh, Andre? No, I didn't want to comment. I think uh, it was said very well. I just agree with the comment. It's, it's okay. I, I think it's right there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, point well made, I think. Uh, points well made, Andre. Um, I see the, the the chat is is quite uh, uh, busy um, with some points coming up, but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, there don't appear to be questions so much as uh, a conversation, which is absolutely fine. Uh, no, at the moment there are no. Uh, also, at other channels there are no further questions. Uh, the last point that was made in the chat was from Joe Hickson, and that he says good points, but kind of think. Uh, like Google would contract with. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm conscious uh, of the time. So if people do have any last questions before we, we, we go to the, our reporter, um, you know, you'll, you'll need to raise them uh, shortly. Um, in the meantime, I'll maybe ask the, uh, the, our panelists, um, um, do you see any other impacts uh, of DS encryption having on the uh, internet ecosystem? Um, uh, any, any other unexpected uh, impacts um, uh, as a consequence of, of encryption? Uh, Vittorio, it looks like you are wanting to come in. 
No, well, um, I think that uh, perhaps the, at a higher uh, abstraction level, this discussion has brought up again the, the question of whether, uh, I mean, the, the, the reciprocal roles of, of the ISPs and internet access providers versus the platforms. And I think that, I mean, uh, we, we, we are in the middle of a trend in which services are increasingly moving from the ISPs to the platforms. And again, that's a general trend that, uh, I mean, there's a reason for that. I mean, maybe the ISPs should think of what they did in the last 20 years. Because if, I mean, if there are people that uh, still insist in saying that they connected to an ISP, but they want to be protected by it, so they distrust it. I mean, that, that there must have been mistakes in the past about the, in how the ISPs used to treat their customers, but maybe that's not the case anymore. So, and uh, I mean, at the same time, I, 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 I'm really concerned, and I think most people are concerned by the decentralization effect in which we have very few, very big companies taking over everything. I mean, the, the last point uh, I, I wanted to make is that the, it's really important and in this regard to preserve the original idea of, of the internet is that they could connect and discover services locally. So, I mean, we, we haven't mentioned that the efforts that are going on to uh, create actual discovery mechanisms, so that's, I mean, like they exist for the current unencrypted DNS, so that you can connect to the network and, actu and actually know if there's a local resolver that can give you the DNS resolution service. And then, I mean, depending on your own policy as a user, you might want to trust it and use it or not trust it, not use it. And you maybe have your own trusted resolver somewhere else and you want to connect to it. I mean, that, that's open. But at least you should be able, if you want to just continue using your local resolver, to discover it automatically. And this is also very important for adoption. Because most people, I mean, most users in the end are not particularly interested in this discussion. They just want to continue using the internet. They buy internet service from a company. They expect that the company provides everything that's necessary for the internet to work, which includes the DNS resolution service. And they just want to go ahead and use it. So, I mean, it's very important that uh, as an industry, we provide a way for, I mean, the internet access provider to at least continue offering this and, and being able to, I mean, make this work automatically so that people just connect to the network and everything works fine, which is in the end the most important thing, I'd say. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Vit Vittorio. Um, uh, again, I'm just watching the time. So um, I don't know if uh, uh, Andre uh, or Nick, if you, so based on what you've heard, if you had any comments you wanted to come in on more generally, uh, just to build on uh, either what you heard or indeed what v Vittorio has just covered. I'm seeing comments from Andre. So, uh, hi, uh, hi again. Uh, just uh, just um, a technical uh, detail. So if you have uh, DOT or DOH, there is um, uh, much slowness in getting uh, DNS queries resolved, which can be bad in the beginning. So uh, if you have just normal DNS queries, uh, you should have a very fast packet sent to the cloud, uh, not to the cloud, to the, to the provider, which is very local. Um, so that's going to be very fast. If you do have packets that you send to a provider, maybe uh, somewhere in your continent, not necessarily in your country, uh, that will go to your provider first and then to someone else and then to someone else until it arrives at the destination. Also, because you have to encrypt everything um, uh, on traffic, and uh, especially if you are using TCP IP, it does take the three-way handshake plus something else, uh, plus if you add encryption, uh, that's going to be much slower. So I'm uh, I'm thinking maybe about ten times as slow to get the DNS query. And in some applications, I'm not going to say all, but at least some applications, uh, this will be a, a definitely drawback uh, because they will require fast DNS resolution. Yeah, I think on, on that, Andre, I've seen some benchmarking which. Um, on some early implementations, there certainly is an overhead, although to be fair, some of the later implementations of, of Doe, um, I think they've been heavily streamlined, um, so there's little difference um, in performance um, between Doe and uh, DNS over uh, sort of port 53 in the more traditional way. Um, so let me uh, just go back around our three key participants to see if they have any final observations they want to make before we go to our uh, reporter for her um, summation. Um, so I'll, I'll do them in the order that they uh, came on uh, uh, initially. Uh, so uh, Andre, do you have any, uh, any thoughts to uh, come back with? Uh, yes, uh, maybe just 
it's it's worth to mention that DOH is not a panacea. It doesn't solve all the issues. It uh, doesn't help the to to protect your privacy. Uh, probably not at all. It maybe even increase the number of uh, subjects that can uh, see some of your data. So uh, that's one problem I have this with this technology. Uh, I think uh, it, it doesn't, you know, protect you from your local ISP. So if you don't trust your local ISP, then you have problems that cannot be solved by by DOH, uh, DOT. Uh, there are different different technologies for that. So uh, again, DO, DOH is an interesting technology, but we have to be very careful. Uh, using it widely, there is a lot of technical operational stability issues uh, that this may trigger. I, I'm not uh, completely opposed to this technology. It's just a technology, of course, but uh, you know we have to be very careful how uh, massively we deploy it. And what I'm really a bit concerned is it's the, it's the concentration of, of DNS resolution to a, a small set of companies and the internet. And I don't think such a con concentration in any industry is a good thing. So uh, I would rather suggest to, to keep DNS traffic local uh, uh, as much as possible. Okay, thank you, uh, Andre. Yeah, some good thoughts there. Uh, Nick. Um, no, I think no no additional comments from my side. I think I said everything I wanted to say, and also Andre gave a very good summary. Thank you, uh, Vittorio. Well, I, I'd finish with uh, an appeal to people. I mean, actually, different you know, different types of people should do different things. So, if, if there are ISPs uh, in, in this room that are not involved yet, or not trying DOH, or, please do. I mean, please uh, think at how you can evolve your DNS services and make them. Uh, also encrypted because that, that's important for your customers and it's important for the continuation of, of your market offer, I'd say. And of course, you can contact Andrew and other people that are involved in coordinating or creating some common action by uh, European providers and we'll be happy to, to help you. And uh, the other thing is for the European community in general, because I mean, uh, what struck, uh, what, what, I mean, I was really uh, surprised by when I learned uh, of, of DOH by discovering that apparently in the initial discussion at the ITF, the, the European perspective was completely absent in, in the sense that it, it seemed that when discussing this, there was this uh, US perspective of freedom of expression and so on. There was the perspective of, I mean, people who might be in China or I mean, in other countries that would benefit from additional privacy against uh, authoritarian regimes. But uh, the, no one seemed to understand the impact this would have uh, on, on European services, uh, so on parental control and other things that are very common in Europe or maybe not in, in, in other parts of the world. And perhaps this happened because the European industry and community were not really very present in the discussion of the IDF. So they, I mean, I, I will encourage people to be more active in, in the IDF, people from Europe, and, and also we have an, uh, another workshop this afternoon, workshop number five, which is going to discuss this broader issue. I mean, relationship between the, the community, the non-technical stakeholders, and the technical standardization groups. So this is also an invitation for you to join us this afternoon. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Vittorio. Uh, well, what I would like to do now, uh, then, is uh, to uh, uh, ask uh, Ilona, uh, the, uh, the reporter from the Geneva Internet Platform for our session, to uh, come on uh, to the session to uh, uh, share the session, session messages that she's captured and uh, uh, we can then have a discussion about those and gain agreement uh, to them. So if I could ask uh, Ilona to be brought on to the session, please. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the sound is good? Yes, Very good. good. So uh, I'm representing the Geneva Internet Platform, and we provide uh, key messages and session reports for the whole year with uh, event. And uh, also, you will be able to comment on the messages that I provide now after the uh, forum is end. Uh, after the forum ends. So uh, since it is, uh, since we need to have a rough consensus on each message. Uh, I'm, I'm just asking you to raise the OH, DOT, has different effects on end users, on ISPs, on operating system, browser, and applications. Though DOH can improve privacy and security of an end user, it can bring additional problems. Limited choice of DNS resolvers, specific browser OS configurations, and their upgrades. 
For ISPs, it creates even more problems. The balance of power between browsers and various communities is broken, high risks of uh, market and network centralization. Uh, next slide, please. We have to work uh, on the uh, deployment models that will address those problems, keeping in mind education of end users about DNS operations and increasing the level of trust in ISPs and DNS resolvers. Also, we need to think about legal aspects of relationships between end users and DNS providers. Now I pass the, the mic to the uh, moderator. So. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Ilona. Um, and from a personal view, I say congratulations on trying to translate that into human. <laughs> um, that's a remarkable job, in my humble opinion. Um, but uh, I can, and I can see uh, on the chat some um, supportive messages on your summary abilities from uh, Thomas uh, Grober from Jim Prendergast. Uh, and others uh, coming in. Um, I guess we just need to see if um, if there are people that think there's anything fundamentally wrong with with that summation, or if uh, Ilona has indeed captured the uh, spirit of the uh, discussion. So, does anyone want to come in to indicate otherwise? I see just plus one and plus one. <laughs> Okay, uh, DNS Pro DH. Um, is it is it really critical if we talk about uh, particularly DOH providers? This is the question for tech people. Can you rephrase that, Ilona? Sorry, I didn't quite follow. It. Uh, so I see the the comment uh, in the Zoom that the last uh, message. <clears throat> Sorry. The last uh, message, relationship between end users and DNS providers or DOH providers, which should be more correct. Uh, a lot of DOH providers will be more correct because DNS providers is all existing ISPs also because they operate the resolvers. And we are talking about specific DOH providers who concentrate the DNS queries so it's better to replace it with the DOH. Okay, I, I changed it in the presentation. If the presenter can upgrade it, you will see. Okay. Um, although as is being said in the chat, um, it could equally apply to uh, DNS more, more broadly, but Mikhail is right, the session was specifically focused mm -hmm. on, on DOE, but uh, it could apply to either. Okay, so now we are done with this. Okay, brilliant. In that case, Good. thank you very much, uh, Ilona, for that very impressive, um, succinct uh, encapsulation of, of the uh, points uh, that, that we covered. Um, um, I'm impressed. Um, uh, so uh, just to wrap up then, um, thank you everyone for your uh, participation. Uh, so thank you for joining our workshop and for your um, uh, uh, continuing flow of comments and questions throughout, which was extremely uh, helpful and uh, productive. Uh, thank you in particular to uh, Andre, Nick and Vittorio for um, uh, uh, sort of jumping into the hot seats and uh, giving their views and, and taking some of the questions. That's much appreciated. Um, and thank you to um, the uh, studio team and uh, hosts as, as well um, uh, for all of your, your efforts in making this work smoothly. Um, and I think we're all looking forward to some uh, excellent sessions this afternoon. And I should shamelessly uh, advertise workshop five, which Vittorio also mentioned, which will look at how these standards are developed in the first place, which will maybe pick up on some of the points arising in the chat around the maybe the lack of a European perspective um, in Doe. Um, and we'll develop that discussion further uh, in workshop five this afternoon. So with that, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of Eurodig. <laughs>